This is Lucas Chiumbo. This is the moment he won the 2019 Nazare Toe Surfing Challenge, the world's most exciting big wave event. And this is 19-year-old Mateus Hurdy. He is considered one of the rising stars in surfing. This is him ripping during airborne. This is Carlos Bjorn, also a legendary big wave surfer. Next to Carlos is Rodrigo Kosha. This is Adriano de Souza. And this is Pedro Scooby. So you might be thinking, what do all of these surfers have in common? They all come from Brazil. And in the past decade, there has been a huge influx in surfing champions coming from Brazil. So what is it about these surfers that are dominating this sport from a country that isn't typically known for its big waves? But before we can talk about Brazilian surfers, we first have to take a brief look at the history of surfing and the competition surrounding them. During the 1960s, surfers from all across the world flocked to Hawaii to surf the infamous waves of the North Shore. Known for its consistent breaks during the winter months and waves that ranged between 10 to 60 feet, Hawaii's waters were enough to attract any experienced surfer. And over the years, crazier surf spots started to be discovered all across the globe. And with that, the competitions would tour the world from Hawaii and Tahiti to California and Australia. But notice how Brazil wasn't on that list. And there weren't even many Brazilian surfers taking part, let alone winning. Brazil has more than 4,000 miles of coastline, and the Brazilians have been surfing its waves at least since the Australian surfer Peter Troy gave a demonstration in Rio in 1964. So why did it take 50 years for the Brazilian storm to dominate the world of surfing? Especially when you look at the geography of Brazil, the country has a large coastal population within densely built up areas, forcing people to the beaches to socialize, relax and exercise. Brazilians became really serious about surfing, but the problem was that nobody was actually making it big internationally. Well, that was partially to do with the country itself. In the 1980s and 1990s, Brazil was in a rocky place with an unstable economy with inflation rates which reached up to 2000% per year. Now, you're probably thinking, what the hell does this have to do with surfing? I clicked on this video to see surfing. But trust me, this has got everything to do with it. And after those hardships of the 80s and 90s, Brazil turned a corner, and in the 2000s, it experienced more than a decade of stability and growth. The gap between the rich and the poor narrowed a little, and the middle class ballooned from about 15% of the population in the early 80s to nearly two-thirds by 2012. And the second issue was the waves. Brazil sits on a large continental shelf in the Atlantic, which means there is not a single first-rate break along Brazil's coastline. To become a top pro surfer, you need to have versatility and experience in larger, more powerful surf. But Brazil's difficult economic position in the 80s and 90s meant only very few Brazilians were able to travel to such locations. And even the ones who did manage to make it out to the competition hotspots went without support, money, technical assistance. There were plenty of Brazilians who had mastered the waves of Hawaii, but they were consistently underrepresented by the surf media. They spoke broken English and there was a culture clash. They developed a reputation as loud, obnoxious and aggressive, which kept them out of favor of dominant surfers and foreign fans and the media. It's ironic that the perception of the early Brazilian surfers from the Americans and the Australians could be seen as a mirror reflecting the very behavior that they themselves demonstrated when they first showed up in Hawaii decades earlier. Yet today, Brazilians are the dominating force in surfing. This is the reaction of the people of Brazil back in 2014 when Gabriela Medina won the world's premier surfing title and became the first South American man to do so, and the country erupted into celebration. This subsequently marked the start of the Brazilian storm paddling out in packs across the world tour, dominating breaks in solidarity and not looking to back down. The surfers that we see today like Lucas Chiumbo and Matias Hurdy and so many more all came up in Brazil's decade of growth and had support along the way. They managed to travel to Hawaii regularly to develop their competitive skills. But as much as a rising economy enabled these athletes to be noticed, that factor alone can't be what made Brazil one of the world's best surfing nations. 
Yeah, yeah. Andy, can you hear me? Hey, Lucas. Hello. Thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. Where does the uh, where does the determination come from? The drive and the ambition come from for you guys to compete? I think the Brazilians have that go for it because in Brazil nothing is easy. We got the worst waves here. We don't got money. We don't got sponsors. It's like pretty hard. So when we got there, we got like so much pressure. I gotta like earn it, you know. I was a guy who never had sponsor. My dad always helped me. The surfing here got way more serious mm. when Gabriel came. Like changed the subject. I ch changed everything. I was there. Oh my gosh, how I was Brazil. We feel the energy now. Before it was just us trying to survive on the on the surfing community. I think we always had really good surfers. Surfing before was kind of like a, it's pretty hard because when you're from USA or when you're from Australia, it's it's way easier for us. Back in the day, they were doing the same things as you know all the other other surfers were doing. That we're from Brazil, we don't. Like, we don't have that kind of money, you know? And then every day, like, people compares me to one guy that never got to compete in the QS. Because when he was 17, he was, like, the best surfer. And then he never got to go there, you know? So I know a lot of stories about that. So Brazilians look to their underdog reputation and apply their competitive strengths they're known for in other sports like football and Formula One and used it as inspiration as well as a way to support their families and communities, which ends up being a way better motivation than just trying to be the most famous surfer. These surfers all came up in an era where regional events in Brazil were a huge thing and everybody was competing. The fact that most of the waves were pretty bad could actually play in their favor. They had to generate all the speed and power that the bad waves don't give them and that was the perfect weapon to dominate in the qualifying series once they made out to the major leagues in the locations like Hawaii and Tahiti. It was just a matter of time to adapt to those conditions and go for the titles. Remember the reaction to Gabriel Medina winning in 2014? That helped open the door to the next generation of surfers. In 2015, Adriano really represented the transition from Brazilians being on tour, but not really being considered at the same level as competitors from other countries, to being the Brazilians on tour that everybody was afraid to go up against. His dedication to the sport didn't go unnoticed. He made the decision to move to California to not only train in world-class waves, but to be in a closer proximity to the epicenter of the Southern California surf world. He made an attempt to see the surf world not only from a Brazilian's perspective, but from an American or Australian perspective. He also had a reputation for being the first competitor to show up and the last to leave, in attempts to understand the breaks better than anyone else. And it worked. Adriano went on to win the world championship that year. 26-year-old Italo Ferreira is currently the world champion and won last year at Red Bull Airborne in Australia. And you might have already noticed that it's not just traditional surfing that Brazilians are dominating in. Surfers like Lucas Chiombo, Rodrigo Kosha, Pedro Scooby have all found success in big wave surfing. In 2017, Rodrigo broke the Guinness World Record for the biggest wave ever surfed here in Nazare, coming in at 80 foot. And for comparison, that is the same size as this great Buddha in Southern India. The surfers in Hawaii, Tahiti, Australia, California, and Portugal might well have had the at-home advantage of having these rideable waves in their back garden. But I think that reaffirms the tenacity, determination, and competitive strength of the Brazilian surfers, who saw a glimpse at native success and understood that this was their time to shine, and they no longer were held back or seen as the lesser competitors in the surfing world. And if recent years are an indicator of the future, it looks like the Brazilian storm is set to continue.